Hello, everyone. Welcome to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. I'm Danny Bassa. I'm joined today with my guest, Dr. John Lewis in Florida. How are you, Dr. Lewis? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Um, so there was a uh, contact of ours on Facebook who said that we should have him on. Uh, and frankly, we didn't really know a ton of what it was that he did. We received a TED Talk uh, by video that we watched, which was pretty interesting. Uh, we're going to have the link for that TED Talk uh, below in um, below the, <laughs> below the video, and uh, so we discuss a lot on the channel about uh, you know optimizing our hormones and trying to get better nutrition and how to train better and how to sleep better and all these things that we can do to improve. And Dr. Lewis uh, is doing a lot of work in research uh, these days and also has developed products in regards to uh, brain health, cognition. Um, working with even uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patients, uh, joint pain, a number of things. So I'm going to kind of leave the floor here to, to uh, Dr. Lewis, and he could tell us about uh, some of the stuff he's doing. So please fill us in. Take it, take it away. Yes. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate your interest in, in my work. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you today and, and get to know you and share with you a little bit about my career and where we're going and what we hope to do. The, uh, as, a, as just a little disclaimer, I'll tell you the, uh, the TEDx talk that evening, I was very ill. So sometimes people have asked me, well, why were you coughing when you were uh, on stage? I, I literally came out of my bed, drove to the event and was lying on the couch. That's how much like I was just so out of it. I had a bad fever, a bad congestion, the whole nine yards. But I said, you know, this is probably a very unique opportunity. So let me go out here and give it my best shot. So I wasn't, I certainly was not at peak condition, but I, I got through it. But anyway, sometimes people ask me that. So I just wanted to let your listeners and viewers know what happened to me that evening. But uh, let's let's start out with uh, with a word that <clears throat> I like to use when I help to educate people a little bit about the work that I've done in nutrition, and that is um, in my career I was fortunate enough about uh, it's been a, actually it's going on like 12 years ago since we're coming up on the new year. Uh, it's it's hard to believe it's been that long, but I was introduced to the concept of how important polysaccharides are for our health. Um, and studying nutrition in grad school and, and getting into that in my, not only my professional life, but my personal life, I really, no one was, had ever educated me about the impact that polysaccharides could use on our health. And so, you know, when you think about what is a polysaccharide, well, a polysaccharide in layman's terms is a sugar. Now, if I asked you, do you think sugar is good? Most people would probably say, oh, no, sugar's bad. Like, right? And like, you know, we have just because of so much media attention that's on the word sugar today, you think sugar is bad for you. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Sugars are actually very good for us. It just depends on the sugar. So there are lots of sugars that occur in nature, lots of sugars that that uh, Mother Nature has given us to, to utilize. Uh, and I'd be the admit, of course, Sucrose, high, cro high fructose corn syrup, those are sugars we clearly should avoid. No question about it. But when you're talking about certain complex polysaccharides that occur in food, these are very, very beneficial to us. They, they have so much coded information in them, way more than amino acids and essential fatty acids do. So think about that for a second. You know, we, we have this growing interest and movement in people who are uh, so caught up in, you know, high high fat and granted we need we need essential amino acids we need essential fatty acids those are um, molecules that we cannot get the body to synthesize itself we have to get those from food so absolutely those are important for us as well but these polysaccharides although they're not essential because the body in its own intelligence can take something like glucose and convert it into one of these uh, polysaccharides so by definition, it will never be essential in the strictest terms of what essential means in nutrition. But nonetheless, because we typically do not get many of these complex polysaccharides in the diet anymore for a whole host of reasons, my colleagues and I believe this is one of the reasons, at least, and certainly there are many reasons, but one of the reasons why there is such a rise in chronic disease today. 
So you're probably thinking, okay, well, John, get to the good stuff. Which polysaccharides are we talking about, right? So uh, one of the most important ones that I learned about, again, this is a story going back about 12 years, is the polysaccharides found in aloe vera. So aloe vera obviously has a long history with humans dating back probably, I don't know, several thousand years. I'm not sure. I'm not a historian, but I know aloe vera has been around for a very long time in terms of humans using it. But what do we think of aloe vera primarily for? We think of, you know, if you get a sunburn, exactly, you're rubbing your skin. If you get a sunburn, if you cut yourself, if you have some sort of a wound, you think, okay, aloe vera is one of my go-tos. And certainly I would encourage anybody to do that. However, it's much more powerful when we take it in our mouth. Now, <clears throat> aloe vera is about 98.5% water, the gel is. So imagine that most of that gel is water and then you have a little bit left over that's polysaccharide and some other different phytochemicals. So to get enough of those polysaccharides in your mouth, in the body to actually be therapeutic or actually to have a physiological effect, you know, you'd have to drink bucket loads of, uh, of this gel. So it'd literally be impossible to get enough polysaccharides just by consuming aloe vera gel. I'm not telling any of your listeners to not use gel. It certainly could be something useful, say for a GI problem. But if you have a very serious chronic health challenge, for example, cancer, uh, HIV, heart disease, Alzheimer's, anything, you know, really serious and life threatening, I would tell you, you're wasting your money if you think you're going to get enough polysaccharide out of aloe vera gel. Uh, another one is rice bran. Rice bran is a phenomenal food that most people actually think of as waste. Uh, people don't even consider the value of how much nutrition is in rice bran. In fact, a lot of countries, when they're going through the milling process with the rice, they take the rice bran and they either throw it away or they use it for animal food. It's not even used uh, for humans. So imagine that. You, yeah, exactly. You have this byproduct of the milling process that basically gets either thrown away or fed to animals. But meanwhile, it's loaded with all of these complex polysaccharides that are so beneficial for us. And not only does it have uh, the polysaccharides, it has vitamins, it has minerals, it has elements, cofactors, other compounds, literally just loaded with nutrition. But it's something that people don't even recognize for its nutritional value. So those are just a couple of examples of two products that I've studied in my career, in my research career, while still as a full-time professor at the University of Miami. And and now transitioning for the last couple of years as entrepreneur, businessman, marketer, uh, I'm leveraging or utilizing the science that I conducted for uh, about 15 years to now uh, a, a company that has a science base to it, a, a dietary, specifically a dietary supplement company, Nourish Me, where we're selling products that not only I take for myself, my family, close friends, anybody who will listen to me, uh, and I'd be, I consider myself, you know, somebody who lives what he says. In other words, I wouldn't sell anything that I wouldn't take for myself. But we are a very science-based company that uses the science that, and I've personally conducted and one of my partners as Dr. Michael Hager, uh, to offer people very beneficial products for human health. Um, so what is some of that science you may be thinking about? So. Alzheimer's is a huge problem. Uh, this is a problem for at least the last, well, half decade anyway, has been all over the, the news, all over the mass media in the United States. I'm not so sure about Canada, but a lot of news has focused on the failures of big pharma to really offer anything to people uh, who have this terrible disease. And it's now the number six leading killer of Americans. There essentially is no treatment. Uh, meaning there is no cure, there's no preventative strategy. And this is all from like the, you know, the conventional medical big pharma perspective. I'm not, I'm not really talking about anything related to nutrition or uh, you know, exercise, lifestyle type behavior. I'm, I'm talking strictly from a conventional medical perspective. So <clears throat> back, back up even more years than that, going back to about 12 years ago, where one of my colleagues was presenting some work that he had been doing with the allopolysaccharides in some patients with Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's. 
And he had a lady come up to him afterward and say, wow, I'm very, very impressed with, with some of this work you're doing. Would you be interested in accepting a gift from my husband and I? We've lost four family members to Alzheimer's disease, and we would like to support your effort. Well, he was not affiliated with the university at that time, but he called me up and he said, hey, John, I just had a lady offer me some money for research, but we would need to do a study in Alzheimer's. And I said, let's go for it. And so <clears throat> to make a very, very long story short, uh, we ended up conducting a clinical trial with this formula that we now call Cogni Nourish. And we took people who had moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. These were not you know, mildly impaired. This was not mild cognitive impairment. This was moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. And the patient had to be diagnosed at least for a year. So these were very sick people and we didn't care what medication they were taking. I believe if memory serves me correctly, all of them had tried at least one, if not all of the FDA approved drugs for dementia. So they had tried the entire cognitive uh, or the, the entire spectrum when it comes to these anti-dementia drugs. They had other comorbidities, meaning that they had other things like depression, diabetes, heart disease, you name it. You know, a lot of times we don't get just one chronic disease. We get one plus several other things, but we didn't care about that. We really wanted to try to help people that had the worst condition. And even back then, you know, 10, 12 years ago, the media had really caught on to that whole story of brain health and the tragedy of Alzheimer's the way it has, you know, subsequently. Actually, it was kind of interesting timing because, you know, like I said, I, I mean, this wasn't really exactly my own personal interest in terms of my research focus. I just kind of fell into it. So I was just in the right place at the right time. But as we were going through the study and, and the intervention itself was a year long, so it took us a while. We only had 34 subjects in the study, but it, it was an entire year intervention. So it took us a while to accrue that many subjects. And then, of course, to follow those people over a year of time is not an easy thing either, especially when you have a caregiver. It's not like you're just intervening with one person, the, the subject, but then you have the caregiver level as well. And then, you know, the family unit in terms of all the other people who may be helping uh, to take care of this person. So just from a logistical perspective, it was a very, uh, I would say, challenging study to, to conduct. But the good news is, on the one hand, you have all these other layers of, let's say, technical issues to deal with. On the other hand, you had caregivers who were very motivated. And so I had a lot of them call me up and say, you know, I'm so happy for your study because my loved one is not eligible for the, for the pharmaceutical studies. You know, big pharma doesn't really, they're not really interested in intervening in people who have moderate to severe disease because they kind of look at those people as lost causes. They want to try to get people early in the disease, early stage to where they think maybe there's a better chance of cutting off the disease's progression at that point. Once somebody gets past that, then they kind of say, nah, it's too late for you. You're, you're kind of done. So we looked at it completely oppositely. We didn't, we didn't want to throw those people away, so to speak. We wanted to conduct a study to give someone with severe disease a chance, uh, you know, to, to, to get something out of it. The other fascinating thing about our study is the staff that we were working with, all of these folks were very, very skeptical of nutrition. These were people who, again, very conventionally oriented, only doing like pharmaceutical work. But they said to us, well, you guys have some money. We have a lot of Alzheimer's patients. We're happy to get together. We're happy to help you. But guess what? You're doing nutrition. We don't think it's work. <laughs> I mean, they literally, I'm not even exaggerating. This is literally what these folks were telling us from the, from the medical director to the psychiatrist to the neuropsychologists, to the clinical coordinators, all these people were like, wow, nutrition? You think nutrition may do something for Alzheimer's? Wow, like they couldn't even, they couldn't even conceive that. They just thought it was so unusual that nutrition could possibly help people with such a horrible, tragic, hopeless disease. So, <clears throat> excuse me, again, as I mentioned, the intervention was about 12 months or was 12 months and we evaluated people at baseline three, six, nine, and 12. 
So we had a, a very extensive neuropsychological test every three months when people would come in for the assessment. And then at baseline in 12 months, due to the funding limitation, we could only blood at baseline in 12 months. So we didn't really, we didn't know what was going on at three, six, and nine in terms of, you know, what was happening in the blood. But I would say, and this has been quite a while ago, so even my memory now is not exactly, you know, specific to, to how much uh, this occurred. But, you know, generally speaking, after about the first, say, six or seven subjects that had been enrolled in the study, and now they're starting to come in even before the three-month assessment, because these, these were people who were participating in a daycare program. So they would come to the center you know, just for interaction with other people, just to have some sort of a little bit of stimulation rather than sitting at home by themselves all day, they would come into this daycare program. So the staff were already familiar with these people. They already knew who they were and they were seeing them, you know, much more frequently than just every three months. So as these were starting to come back in after they'd been in the study for a little while, after they'd been taking the supplement, the staff was calling me saying, wow, I cannot believe what so-and-so is doing right now. And this went on now for about a, probably, I think it took us about two to three years to conduct, you know, all 34 subjects for that one year period of time. So <clears throat> as we're going through the study, I'm getting more and more of this sort of, let's call it like a reversal, you know, this major switch was going on uh, in the staff. They go from being like, skeptics or non-believers to saying, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, Mrs. So-and-so is now saying something or talking about something. One of the most profound examples was, I believe this lady was the oldest subject in our study. She was in her nineties. She had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's for about 11 years. At baseline, she was sitting in a wheelchair and could not speak. Totally out of it, just like a piece of furniture. At the three month assessment, she came into the center walking and she called one of the coordinators by name, Raphael. This guy started crying like a baby. It was so emotionally profound for him, it just overwhelmed him. He could not believe this lady was now walking and actually remembered his name for the very first time. So, you know, when things like that started happening. I mean, I had caregivers calling me up out of the blue saying, Dr. Lewis, I cannot believe my husband, my wife, my grandmother, whoever, you know, whatever the relationship was. Now he or she is talking about things, doing things, remembering events, anniversaries, birthdays, weddings, whatever. I mean, it's giving me, I get, I'm getting chill bumps right now. Every time I tell this story, it gives me chill bumps because you know, this is beyond science. Like this is beyond just scientific discovery. This is, this is affecting people's lives. You know, this is giving somebody back something that they lost. And I'm not saying these people suddenly became like, you know, completely lucid. I'm not saying they were carrying on a conversation to this degree, but the fact that they could actually remember family members again, remember events that were so important to them, that mattered to them, you know, and these were formerly very functional people. These weren't like, you know, people that were impaired before they got Alzheimer's. These were, you know, functioning, well-adjusted, productive members of society who go from that to being again, like a piece of furniture. So for the, how long I, I'm sorry, how long did it typically, it, would it typically take for you to see some kind of a, a change occur? Was it like after a month or two or three or, Great question. So we had a very variable response time. And I, you know, our, our, my colleagues and I, we don't know why that is. Is that a, you know, the first default thing people think of, a, well, it's genetic difference. Very could be true. I don't, I don't know. You know, obviously, genes can explain disparity in, in some ways. But to answer your question, in some cases, we literally saw changes within a few days where people had what I call them fast responders, right? Like, wow, like, Nutrition is working super fast uh, for some people. Other people, it took several months. On average, what I tell people is if somebody's really impaired, again, we're talking things like Alzheimer's, cancer, HIV, diabetes, you know, heart disease, something very severe and life threatening. I say give it at least 90 days because nutrition is not pharmacology. 
our physiology takes time in many cases to respond and you can't just expect results overnight. It's like you have a headache and you take a Tylenol and you know, you, you expect your headache to go away in a few minutes. That's not the way nutrition works. It takes time for the body basically to um, recreate itself. And that's what we do every day. That's part of the reason we live day to day is our stem cell uh, production process recreates us, you know, on an ongoing basis. And depending on the type of cell, you know, one thing is different from the other. But again, to answer your question, it's, it's difficult to answer simply because of that variation. Again, whether it's due to genes, uh, maybe other nutritional factors that we didn't account for. One thing to, to definitely tell your listeners about this study that is very interesting. Again, I mentioned we didn't screen people, screen people for different types of comorbid diseases. It didn't matter what else they had. We didn't change their medication. We didn't change their diet. We didn't change their exercise. We didn't change anything else about their lives. We just simply gave them a dietary supplement. So imagine if we had done other things, maybe improved their diet, maybe put them on exercise, maybe you know, tried to do things with stress management or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, there could have been so many other things that we could have added to the study but I think that is actually good for us in the sense that we show the power of nutrition just by giving a dietary supplement without intervening on any other level. That's, that's pretty cool. That's really good. So it's, it's kind of, I guess, the same type of approach as people say, uh, you know, we take uh, amino acids. Yes, we can get it from food, but, you know, I would have to eat, uh, you know, 12 steaks to have the amount of amino acids. I can get it one little scoop of stuff. So I guess with the polysaccharides, it's kind of the same the same type of thinking of like you were saying with the aloe vera, we'd have to just eat bucket loads, just get a condensed version. And, and that was it. Okay. And this comes in, uh, is this in a powder or is it a pill? Yes. Is it a drip? Yes. Cognitive nourish is a powder. So, uh, we could obviously put it in a capsule. We could even uh, condense it down into a tablet, uh, with our platform technology that nourish me has, we've attempted to, perhaps go down the road of making it a liquid at some point in the future. But the problem with that is that these complex polysaccharides are very high molecular weight uh, or they're big particles, not necessarily high molecular weight. And so it's difficult in the nano encapsulation process to put big particles into a nano encapsulation. So plus it's hard to get as much concentration of the actives in a liquid compared to a powder. So probably we'll never end up, making cognitive nourish into a liquid. It seems to be best as a powder simply because you can easily modify the dose. Uh, as you know, if you have something that comes in a tablet, well then, you know, that's just a tablet unless you can right. uh, cut it in half or somehow crush it up. But it's very easy to, to modify the dose uh, in a powder. But before we move on to any other topics, I just want to go back to the study just, just for a moment, just to mm -hmm. kind of summarize the findings. So, what was just, again, mind blowing, you know, as we're going through the study and we're listening to the feedback, uh, not only from the staff, but from the caregivers, we finally get to the end of data collection. And so as I'm starting the process of actually analyzing our data statistically to see what we have, at nine and 12 months, it turns out that the cognitive functioning score improved, this is the ADAS COG, which is probably the most widely used tool. I'm, I'm pretty certain it's the most published tool uh, for dementia studies. So it's a, it's, you know, it's very validated for many, many years. This actually improved clinically and statistically significantly. When I saw that, I literally fell out of my chair. I was, I was almost overcome to, with tears because this was kind of like the Holy grail, uh, you know, for finding something that could actually improve cognitive functioning. And when I use the word cognitive functioning, that includes memory, that includes processing speed, uh, executive functioning, all the components. There are a whole list of components that go under that term cognitive functioning. And then that's for another topic, actually. But just to let the listeners know that that does include memory, because obviously that's something that, you know, we think of when we think of our brain and, you know, not losing the brain's functioning. Memory is obviously, you know, if not the first, certainly one of the first things that we think of when we think about what our brain does for us is, you know, if you lose your memory, if you can't remember things, that's, that's certainly a hallmark of, of dementia, among other things. 
So finding that was huge. And the reason why, not only again, to validate these anecdotal responses we were hearing uh, from the staff and from caregivers, but also the fact that, guess what? The FDA dementia approved drugs, basically, if you're lucky, they will delay your decline for a few months. And then after that, you keep falling off the cliff. FDA approved dementia drugs do not improve cognitive function. They will, again, if you're lucky, keep you kind of stable for a few months, and then you just keep falling off the cliff. I've, I've used the analogy of Alzheimer's today is like HIV was 30 years ago. Before the advent of antiretroviral medication, if you got HIV 30 years ago, it was basically a death sentence. The antiretrovirals came along in, uh, I forget if it was 94, 96, it was in the mid-90s. And then after that, with a partial reconstitution of the immune system, now people with HIV basically live with a chronic disease like diabetes or hypertension or some of these others. But <clears throat> again, Alzheimer's today is like a death sentence from a conventional perspective because the drugs do nothing for you. And then guess what? FDA typically doesn't even approve these drugs with cognitive functioning in their data analysis or in their studies, which my partners and I just found to be mind boggling when we were, you know, looking at how Cognineurish compares to some of these drugs. It was really interesting that these drugs get approved and they don't even have to show improvements in cognitive functioning, which, you know, to, to me is just mind boggling. Welcome to the pharmaceutical world. We see that all the time. That's right. So on the one hand, we have this just beautiful improvement in, uh, in cognitive functioning. And by, and by the way, this has all been published. So um, I'm happy to, you know, share these, these studies with you, these articles with you. And they're, they're on our website, too. We have a library link uh, on our website. So any of your listeners can, can go there and download these articles. But as I mentioned, we also um, drew blood at baseline in 12 months. So I'm sure people would be interested in knowing what we looked at. So in the blood, we were looking at all these inflammatory markers, again, how the immune system functions, the idea that nutrition can help to control inflammation or help to improve immune function is obviously very important, at least for several reasons. One being that we now know through the last 20, 30 years of the study of immunology, that the immune system interacts with every other major, major organ system. And even though you can't you can't really put your hands on the immune system like you can your heart or your brain or your liver or your stomach, but it's so important. And if you don't have a healthy, vital immune, immune system, you're not going to be healthy very long. Uh, and certainly you're, you're subject to, to dying much sooner than you would have if your immune system is surveillant and vital and active. So that's obviously a very important component to it, to this. And then, of course, the word inflammation, this gets thrown around just all over the medical literature today. So you cannot think of any chronic disease without taking into context how inflammation plays a role in that. So obviously, you know, you're focused on TRT and, and things like that. You know that the act of exercising, I mean, acutely, that's inflammatory, right? Like you exercise, you know, you get that surge in and growth hormone and testosterone and all those things and some inflammation along with it. But that's actually a good thing. You want to be inflamed as you're exercising because that's the body's normal response mm -hmm. to exercise or a stressor. I mean, that's a fine response. It's supposed to do that. It's supposed to work that way. But the dysregulated inflammation that gets out of control over time for no basic reason, either because of, well, a host of things, you know, you can't, you don't eat well, actually you don't exercise, that's when you become inflamed. Uh, you don't control stress, you're an insomniac. I mean, there's just so many other things. You smoke, uh, you drink too much alcohol, you know, all these other things cause, go into the story of causing dysregulated inflammation. So again, the same story holds true with Alzheimer's disease. There's this inflammatory or neuroinflammatory component that helps to contribute to this disease. Why that occurs exactly is still an unknown, but that's okay because, you know, hopefully over time we'll eventually get there as we continue looking more and more into how these inflammatory processes work. So going back to our study, basically we wanted to see, again, nutrition or our dietary supplement could help improve the immune system's functioning and also help to control inflammation. So two really important things uh, on the inflammatory side we showed 
were lowering of TNF alpha and lowering of VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. So these two proteins are normally looked at in heart disease and cancer. I think our study is one of the first to look at how these changed in Alzheimer's disease, but we actually showed those things coming down at 12 months. We were so happy uh, to show that we could actually lower inflammatory levels in people with Alzheimer's. Now, again, this is circulating in the blood. This isn't in the cerebral spinal fruit fluid or in the brain itself. So we're kind of, you know, we're theorizing that what's happening systemically is also happening acutely. And then the third thing that we found that was very exciting in our study is that CD14 cells, which are a form of adult stem cells, went up by almost 300% at 12 months. So now imagine these people, their average age was almost 80. It was like 79.9. These are really old folks. They're very old. They have a, a terrible, untreatable disease from a conventional perspective. They're probably not eating very well. You know, they're eating like most Americans, very poor diet. They're certainly not very active. They, in most cases, they can't really be very active. So you've got a very impaired person. Now imagine lowering inflammation and increasing adult stem cells at the same time. Now, as you probably know, 10, 20 years ago, if I had suggested to you the concept of neuroplasticity, you'd have laughed me off your show. I mean, I grew up, you know, I was trained to believe that you're born with so many neurons and that's it. Neurons are not capable of being regenerated. That's absolutely untrue today. We know that neuroplasticity actually is, is something that occurs. The brain can regenerate parts of it. So the only thing that made sense to us, we didn't have money to do imaging studies uh, for this particular trial. And 10 or 12 years ago, I don't know how well imaging would have even, I don't even know how well the technology would have even worked back then. Mm -hmm. I know that there have now been advances in SPECT and PET uh, and other types of imaging that could be utilized today if hopefully at some point in the future, the future we'll have the funding uh, to continue this line of research and do more studies in Alzheimer's. But back then, I don't even know if the funding or, or the imaging would have been even good enough. But lacking that imaging data, what we showed is, again, at the clinical level with improvements in cognitive functioning, lowering inflammation, and then increasing adult stem cell production, it, it creates a really nice triangular model to basically say the only thing that makes sense, why these people were able to come back from the ether, as we said, you know, to be able to sort of regain consciousness, regain the ability to, to be uh, cognitively aware is that those stem cells migrated to the brain and did something. Did they repair neurons? Did they create neurons? Did they create new synapses? Again, that's conjecture. We don't know exactly. But the only thing that makes sense to us is that these allopolysaccharides and other components to our product, again, there's a, a, a pretty good list of, of ingredients we have in there because this is a multifactorial approach is that those nutrients gave the body the materials the raw materials it needs to heal itself that's the only thing that makes sense to us and so part of that healing is lowering inflammation and sending out uh, adult stem cells to the brain to be able to repair itself and to restore what we see on the clinical side being improvements in cognitive function so you can imagine I mean when 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 we were looking at all these data, all these findings, it was just overwhelming for us. In fact, when I submitted this paper to the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, which is one of the leading journals uh, for this particular field, I even got a letter back from the editor-in-chief, which almost never happens. This guy actually wrote to me and said, wow, your, your findings are, are so elegant. And, uh, you know, they basically accepted our paper like in less than 30 days, which I'm sure people in, in the scientific world knows that, that that almost never happens. Like, that's like literally unheard of. Uh, now, since that time, unfortunately, we've had our issues with trying to get, uh, you know, more funding to continue this line of research. But I, and I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but, you know, unless you're doing pharmacological research or genetic research, most large funding organizations have no interest in it, whether it's NIH or the Alzheimer's Association or these other, you know, bodies, they're only focused on drugs and genes. When it comes to th Things like nutrition or dietary supplementation, they're not interested. Not interested. I hear you. I hear you. Um, just a fast question. So 
you, just, you speak a lot about uh, people trying this that had you know primarily Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. What about other type of brain disorders like uh, depression, schizophrenia, personality disorder, what, whatever else? Have you ever encountered people that have tried this and had any type of improvement on on that side of things? Or great. Question. So as, as you and your, and your listeners well know, and you know, nutrition is not uh, specific to one organ system, right? I mean, you, you put something in your mouth and from head to toe, it's doing something. So within the body's own innate intelligence, it knows how to distribute these phytochemicals, nutrients, cofactors, elements, et cetera, to the cells that need it. And it's an, an ongoing constant process 24 seven, right? So uh, we, unfortunately, again, in terms of <clears throat> clinical trials, we've been limited to how much we could do with some of these other uh, disorders and diseases you've mentioned. But one of my colleagues, Dr. Reg McDaniel, who is one of the people who got me into this whole polysaccharide, um, I guess you could say path in life, has documented literally, I believe it's over now, like 800 different diseases and disorders uh, in people with things like you mentioned, schizophrenia, depression, uh, even TBI, even fetal alcohol syndrome. I mean, when you look at all these different things that have happened to the brain, uh, we actually ran another, we did run another study with multiple sclerosis and having very dramatic effects, not unlike the Alzheimer's study. We actually showed at, uh, and it was the same time frame, baseline to 12 months. Although obviously for people with MS, it's not an issue of of cognitive functioning that kills them, what happens with people in MS is that they get these uh, ancillary infections. So typically someone who has MS, they won't necessarily die from the MS itself. They'll die from some type of an infection that they get because their immune system is dysregulated. And so their, their system is not able to, to counteract the infection that they get. We showed it at 12 months in people with MS that their overall number of infections went way down, dramatically down. So that's not only a benefit to the person's quality of life and obviously keeping he, he or she alive, but it's also a major cost saver for the medical system. These people, you know, they're in and out of the hospital all the time getting treated for these infections. So we're now over, I think the number I was told the other day is like $3.2 trillion in what we call a healthcare system in the United States. And it's not, it's a chronic disease management system. It's not a healthcare system at all. Sick care. Uh, it, exactly. Yeah. Care. Exactly. And so, um, you know, if you're in and out of the hospital all the time dealing with infections, I can only imagine what that bill looks like. So to be able to keep people out of the hospital with MS due to, uh, you know, this infection rate, that's huge. That is huge for the MS population. And again, we have all these papers published uh, and all these uh, articles are, are uh, downloadable on our website. But what we have looked at, I can tell you, uh, and I don't want to just, I could talk to you about this stuff for hours. <laughs> you probably already figured out by now. And I know your show doesn't go that long, but uh, with the, with the allopolysaccharides, I can just sum it up for you. So we've done a clinical trial in Alzheimer's, a clinical trial in MS. And then again, my colleague, uh, Dr. McDaniel has literally hundreds of other diseases and disorders. He's documented really more anecdotally, there have been, let's call them some pilot studies, <clears throat> but uh, not as a, as a uh, you know, in terms of like scientific standard, not as quite as high of a level. But with the rice bran, which is a very specific form, it's called the hydrolyzed rice bran or bio bran made by a company in Japan. We've conducted clinical trials in healthy adults, which, you know, otherwise not having say heart disease, HIV, cancer, uh, a study with healthy adults, a study with people with HIV, and a study with people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, those are just the three trials that we conducted. It, it has also been studied really primarily in cancer. Uh, in, I don't know, <clears throat> I've never even counted it up actually, but it's probably at least within, say, 10 or 20 other institutions and universities across the world, primarily in Asia and mostly in Japan, but also in, in places in Europe as well. But very similar to the allopolysaccharide, the hydrolyzed rice bran is such an amazing molecule for the immune system. 
And I, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, it's unfortunate because we don't recognize rice bran's potency, but it's actually a little bit more than that. The story is a little bit more, um, let's say, unique in the sense that what this company does is they take the rice bran and then they hydrolyze it with shiitake mushroom enzyme. So that enzymatic process actually lowers the molecular weight of the molecule. And what it appears to do when, when we take that in is that it becomes a signaling mechanism for the immune system. Hmm. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> for example, in our studies, what we've shown is that it increases the natural killer cell cytotoxicity, which is one of our first lines of defense against invaders. So any kind of like transformed carcinogenic cell that could be on its way to cancer Man, BioBran looks for that thing like you can't believe it. Um, and it also lowers inflammation. We've got really nice data showing that, uh, you know, much like the allopolysaccharides, it lowers TNF-alpha, it lowers VEGF. Uh, it does really nice things for the immune system. So, again, we have a whole series of, of data that we've published on that. Now, what we're doing uh, related to that with Nourish Me is that we've added it to our curcumin. Uh, although it's not to the same concentration as I was mentioning earlier with, uh, with the powder, simply because these molecules are big. And so it's hard to get enough of them into a liquid to where it would be like a super highly concentrated uh, dose, particular, particularly for somebody with a very serious health challenge. But we are coming out with... Cogni Nourish Pro, and if all goes well, that'll be out Q1 of 2020, the first quarter of 2020. And so Cogni Nourish Pro will have the hydrolyzed rice bran added into the Cogni Nourish formula, which actually already contains stabilized rice bran, which is the rice bran that's loaded with nutrition. But now we're going to add the hydrolyzed rice bran to even give us another boost in uh, efficacy and effectiveness when it comes to overall health and wellness and particularly for the immune system. But we do have the, uh, the hydrolyzed rice bran in one of our, we call our curcumin products curcumin. That's our, our retail name. So we have a base curcumin product that's curcumin along with a few other things like vitamin B12, uh, vitamin D, a little bit of iron, a little bit of iodine and a little bit of potassium. And then we have two pro versions of that. One has the aloe polysaccharide, and then the other one has the hydrolyzed rice bran polysaccharide. So our idea with creating these formulas was because we knew that these polysaccharides were such potent immunomodulators. And then curcumin, which you know I haven't even touched on yet, uh, if you go to PubMed and type in turmeric or curcumin, you'll literally pull up, I think the number is now over 12,000 articles that have been published Again, from scientists around the world showing am how amazing uh, this root is for human consumption. Uh, and so, and it, and like the polysaccharides, it also does a lot of things at a very high level in the inflammatory cascade and in immune functioning. So my idea was to add the polysaccharides to curcumin to even give someone uh, a greater boost when it came to people looking for a product that they know their immune system is faulty, it's not working properly. And so they wanna give extra nutrition to try to determine, okay, how can we best uh, boost immune functioning? So that was the concept or the idea behind creating those core human products with adding the polysaccharides to them. So one question I'm sure uh, people will be thinking at this point is, say you take a regular, you know, a regular mm -hmm. dummy like me that doesn't have any any, any known uh, uh, disorders or whatever, um, <clears throat> what, would, what would a regular guy uh, anticipate in regards to improvement if he was to take this product? Just like, I'm, I'm, while you were speaking, I was kind of thinking of that movie, um, Limitless, where that guy takes that, that pill and it, over time it makes him more uh, smarter, he's got better memory, better cognition. Right. Uh, is this a type of thing that if a regular guy would take would just just improve overall brain function uh, or have you uh, dealt with anyone that has tried it for, for that purpose and what were the what were what was the outcome absolutely so I can give you uh, a few anecdotes related to that so for <clears throat> let's start with uh, something that I think will be very fascinating to all your listeners and that is post-exercise training soils so 
So as we get older, you know, obviously when we're in our 20s, you know, we're very, um, we're, I, we're at the peak of our musculoskeletal system. We're at the peak of our testosterone levels, especially for men. You know, we're really at that physical height. And then as we hit our 30s, you know, all those things start gradually declining. And maybe for some of us who are not well at all and haven't been taking, our, taking care of ourselves, that curve is even steeper. Uh, so one thing that happened to me when I started into my mid forties, I'll say it's been, it's been a few years now is that my post-exercise training soreness was becoming just crippling. And I had, I have a long history of weight training. I, I got into uh, drug-free competitive bodybuilding in college and undergrad and did that for a few years. Uh, but then decided after I, you know, was trying to become a professional after I finally finished all of my training. And so I was trying to bodybuild and be a professional at the same time. <laughs> that didn't work for me. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't manage both because training became like another job. And I, I was already working a very mentally, intellectually demanding job. And I, I couldn't do both. I, 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 my hat goes off to the folks who can do stuff like that, but I just wasn't capable but nonetheless, even though I was no longer uh, competing in bodybuilding competitions, I still train that way. And so I've been doing it for roughly 30 years. But as I mentioned, when I hit my mid 40s, my soreness from training was so crippling that I could no longer physically do what my mind wanted to do. So what I was doing to compensate was taking longer time off. You know, I was now trying to condense my training into shorter periods of time, followed up with longer periods of rest, which was really aggravating for me because my body, I know there is definitely an argument out there for efficiency and exercise. And then, you know, there are some people who claim that, you know, like a one set to one set to training to fatigue is actually as beneficial for muscular growth as say more volume training. But I can tell you, like I, my body responds better to, some amount of volume. In other words, I've tried one set training for me. It doesn't work. I can get to a point of, uh, you know, some strength and then my body just, I just cut off. Like I can't go beyond that point. So I know for me, like my body definitely responds to some level of volume training. Maybe it's not exactly what it was when I was 20, 22 years old, but I know that my body likes a certain level of volume training. So <clears throat> it was very aggravating for me to not be able to train to the degree that I wanted to. And at that time, I was taking a curcumin product that was not nano encapsulated. And I haven't even uh, discussed that concept yet, but I'll, I, I'll answer your question and, I'll, and then I'll define that. But basically, this was just like a cur curcumin powder. So curcumin, as another little side tangent, is about 3 or 4% of the turmeric root. So, you know, sometimes people don't even know, like one of my partners, he didn't even know what curcumin was when we decided to join forces. He had heard of turmeric, and, and I think most Americans know what curry is. Maybe they don't like it, but, you know, certainly in Canadians as well. I think a lot of people with the influence of Southeast Asians coming to the West, <clears throat> a lot of people know, you know, Indian food, Pakistani food. So curry is obviously a staple for those cultures. And they make curry with turmeric root. Again, turmeric is, is just a phenomenal root that uh, Mother Nature has gifted us. But about 3% of it, maybe 4, is the curcuminoids. The rest is fiber and other phytochemicals. So what science has really identified over this last, I'd say, 20-year period is that the curcumin is the real magic in the turmeric root. I mean, I'm not saying you can't eat turmeric root for health. I'm just saying if you have a serious health challenge, I would definitely get curcumin. I wouldn't even waste your time with turmeric root powder. It's just not, it's not going to be therapeutic enough to do any benefit. So at the time before I really understood the concept of nano encapsulation and bioavailability of active ingredients, I'm taking this turmeric, uh, maybe it was a curcumin actually, but regardless, I was taking it, was not doing a thing for my post-exercise training sort. So I had a, a biochemist who uh, actually found my Alzheimer's study contact me and he said he was doing some similar work and he asked me if I had, if I was taking curcumin and I said, yes, I am, but I can't really tell it's doing for anything for me. And he said, well, have you ever tried a nano encapsulated curcumin? And I said, no, I don't think I have. 
And that's when I, again, this is going back about six years ago. That's when I went down this path of learning more about bioavailability and why it's so important. And so what actually ended up happening is I started taking his product and within about a two week period, I, re I, I remember this very vividly and I'll go to my grave always remembering this little anecdote. I had trained legs the night before and I usually would do, you know, 20, 25 sets training legs. And usually after a typical legs training session, I'm like, you know, wiped out. I'm like toast, you know, like just kind of crawling out to my car. But that particular evening I was fairly energetic and I thought this is a little strange. Like, and it wasn't like I had a bad training session or anything, but the light bulb didn't really go on for me yet. So I went home, I went to bed, I, I roll out of bed the next morning and I'm kind of like just sort of rubbing my quads a little bit. And I'm like, hmm, I'm not sore. And I jumped out of bed and I didn't have any soreness in my legs. And I was like, oh my God, it's that curcumin. <laughs> and I could not believe the dramatic effect this stuff had on my post-exercise training soreness because I know for most people, like you have that soreness window around 48 hours after a session, but for me, it's between 24 and 48. Sometimes it's even a little quicker, uh, especially for legs. So, man, the light bulb went off for me like that. I instantly put it together. I had been on this stuff for about two weeks, and I guess it took some time. Again, you know, we're talking nutrition, not pharmacology. It took a little time for it to really start working within my physiology. And once it did, man, I'm telling you, I have trained like I'm 20 years old again. I mean, I'm, you know, at this day, I'm 51 years old. I don't know if, you know, most people don't like dating themselves, but what the heck. Um, but I'm, I'm telling you, you guys could, you know, anyone, I, I would <laughs> offer anyone to come to Miami and, and, and go train with me. I train like I'm 20 years old again. I mean, it's literally unreal how this has changed my life. And that's why I got into this story of bioavailability and nano encapsulation because I saw how powerful it was for myself. And that was, again, you know, maybe most people don't think of post-exercise training soreness as being such an important component of their lives but if you if you're someone like me I mean I've been active since I could I mean before I even went to school my grandfather was out in the backyard pitching baseball to me which put me on a track of you know wanting to play sports and just be active basically my whole life so for me to be uh, you know dealing with a situation like soreness which you know, again, it's not life threatening. I didn't lose my mind. You know, it wasn't like I was going to die from it, but it certainly affected my quality of life greatly. Uh, but to answer your question about, you know, again, people that don't have a serious disease or disorder or health challenge, what would they expect to, to, you know, occur? Um, again, it's a bit variable, but I know that, for example, like my mother, uh, who is not, you know, she's, I can't mention her name. I've, I've been sworn not to tell her name publicly or I, her age. I'm sorry, publicly. Uh, she says, you know, like with cognitive nourish, if she runs out for a couple of days, her energy level goes way down. So she really feels it like on that sort of energy sharpness focus level. She says it will totally tank for her after about two days. Uh, we both take two scoops of cognitive nourish per day. My girlfriend takes Two, two scoops per day. I, I basically tell anybody not dealing with a disease or a disorder, you know, as a preventative program to take two scoops per day. I just got an email from a customer a couple of days ago, told me within the first couple of days of taking Cogni Nourish, like he immediately, kind of like my mom's experience, just immediately felt like he, I think in his words, he was Superman. Like he was really sharp, really focused, had like this, you know, energy feeling. So because Cogni Nourish, and by the way, Cogni Nourish and, and the curcumin products, uh, other than the bialo polysaccharide and the one curcumin, all of the nutrients are, are, are all the ingredients are very different. So you can actually, you know, take both products together and that way you're getting a very wide variety of ingredients. And so with Cogni Nourish, uh, particularly because it has many more ingredients, it's kind of the, I say the shotgun approach to health as opposed to a, a, a sniper rifles approach of big pharma where, you know, they're looking for one chemical for one mechanism of action for one symptom of disease or one disease. You know, it's a very sniper like approach. 
but nutrition doesn't work that way. As you know, we need literally hundreds, if not thousands of chemicals, cofactors, elements, compounds, all working in unison, all working at the same time. That's how our body functions. So that's our approach in terms of, you know, giving the body, uh, you know, all that it needs to function properly. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going from the uh, American perspective. I'm assuming maybe it's a bit similar in Canada, but people are always looking for that one, you know, magic bullet. And physiology doesn't work that way. I, I'm always having to help people understand, you know, look, nutrition isn't about a magic bullet. Nutrition is about giving the body all these different things that it needs at the same time to function properly. I mean, once you go beyond oxygen, which is obviously our fundamental nutrient, now these cells need so many different things to function properly. And so if you're deficient in any of those, obviously we can overcome it acutely. It's not, probably not going to be tragic, you know, in that particular moment. But if you keep having those tragic moments one after the other for days and weeks and months, at some point down the road, you're going to end up with disease or disorder. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So again, going back to your question, a lot of times people report to us uh, that they have either, you know, on the on the brain or the mind level, they have improvements in sharpness, clarity, focus, energy. And on, uh, I guess, more disease or disoriented levels, <clears throat> pain is one of the areas where we really hit, especially with the curcumin products. People who have things like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, different types of neuropathies. I, I can think of several cases of, uh, of people with sciatica, which is obviously a very aggravating type of pain for, for many people out there. And, you know, they try medications, they try chiropractics, massage therapy, acupuncture, you know, all different types of modalities to help relieve that. I know one lady in particular, I'm thinking off the top of my head, she had sciatica for, I think she said about 20 years. Uh, nothing helped her. Literally within 15 minutes of taking, I think she took about six or eight drops of the curcumin, her pain completely went away. Hmm. She could not believe it. Like, I get it often myself, and uh, I've tried everything. The, the t just taking testosterone has helped tremendously. I get much less attacks than I did before. I get it from my dad. My dad gets it all the time. So this is uh, definitely of interest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, she, she said, wow, John, I can't believe my sciatica is like, I feel nothing. And that, again, that was in about a 15 minute, uh, minute experience for her. Now, again, she's a fast responder. I mean, some people don't necessarily respond that quickly. And, you know, in my case, like I said, it took me a couple of weeks. Uh, soreness went away. So there is definitely variation individually in terms of, you know, what somebody should expect or, or may expect uh, to have happen for them. And, and obviously, there are so many other factors. I mean, I would have to probably, you know, work with each person just one-on-one -on -one in terms of helping he or she to understand, okay, this is what I'm dealing with. This is why I want to take your products. What can I expect or, or what should happen? So to try to get as much information from somebody as I can uh, would, you know, help to answer that type of question in terms of response time much better. If I can, let me, just spend a moment on talking about nano encapsulation. Cause I think that's something I just kind of glossed over. And I think that's a very important point to, to make for people. So what we have at nourish me is a proprietary technology developed by one of my partners, Dr. Michael Hager, who's a biochemist uh, from the university of Amsterdam. He's been studying how nano encapsulation uh, works for a, a long time in his career and nano encapsulation just simply means that <clears throat> we're taking some kind of a substance. In our case, it's a phospholipid, which are fatty acids. And these fatty acids form the outside of a compound or a molecule. And within the inside of that ring is the active ingredient. And so this is actually sort of replicating what mother nature does for us in our own intestinal tract. So, when we eat something that's fat soluble, our small intestine creates what are called micelles and those micelles encapsulate that fatty acid substance to take it across the lumen into the bloodstream to go out to the target cells. 
So curcumin or turmeric, I should say, is rapidly degraded by our liver. And, you know, again, this is just for whatever reason, the way our physiology works, the way it interacts with something uh, outside of us. So if we take something like turmeric root or curcumin that has not been nano encapsulated into a micellar or a liposome, then unfortunately it's going to get broken down very rapidly. And, you know, as you, I'm sure aware, you know, there, there have been studies looking at, you know, how so many different, um, now we see all these chemicals like in the water supply, uh, in soil, you know, it's like there's very little bioavailability to a lot of products today. So what happens, we just end up either peeing or pooping most of them out and it doesn't ever really actually do anything inside the body. So this concept of bioavailability along, it's sort of, you know, parallel or, or goes together with nano encapsulation is that I think a lot of people assume that when they go into their favorite retailer, you know, whether it's a grocery store or a, a, a vitamin shop or whatever, and they buy their products off the, the shelf and they go home and they take them. They think that they're actually getting all that into the system. That could not be further from the truth. And that's simply due again to this concept of bioavailability. So bioavailability just simply means how much you consume to the proportion of how much you actually utilize. And unfortunately, a lot of products, I've seen a couple of different studies looking at independent analyses of, you know, a company like a third party will go into a store, just pick, you know, 10 things off the shelf, excuse me, and then do a bioavailability study on them and then see what those results are. And so a lot of products on the market, and I'm not just talking specifically curcumin here, I'm talking in general, a lot of products on the market actually have maybe if you're lucky, 10, 20% bioavailability, meaning once again, that you're excreting out 80 to 90% of it without even the body getting any physiological or therapeutic benefit from it. So bioavailability is so important, especially for fat soluble molecules where the body for say water soluble things like vitamin C or the vitamin B's can handle pretty easily. But when it comes to fat soluble substances, so for example, the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K, those are obviously very important. Uh, and then you have things like CoQ10 and curcumin, you know, these other things that people are, are taking now in, in large amounts. If you're not taking something that's nano encapsulated, then chances are you're really just peeing or pooping most of it out without benefiting it. And so <clears throat> when you think about nano encapsulation, the other, I think, important point to consider is our red blood cells are about 5,000 nanometers. When we in nano encapsulate, the curcumin products, we're talking now about the actives being in uh, particle sizes between, I think the lowest is around three nanometers up to a couple of hundred nanometers. So imagine these things are tiny, tiny, tiny particle sizes. So if a red blood cell is 5,000, we're talking about active ingredients that are very small that can now penetrate into the bloodstream to get out to the target cells to do their work because Again, curcumin may have all of this amazing physiological benefit, but if it cannot get out to the cell to do its job, it can't, there's nothing to be gained from it. So again, basically you're just pooping out most of it uh, without ever getting any benefit. So what we're trying to do with our liquids is to give the consumer something that's highly bioavailable that will actually work. And that's why if you go either to our store on our website or to Amazon, and you see a lot of the feedback we're getting so far. And our products have only been for sale uh, just for about a year. So, you know, we're relatively still new to the marketplace. We're not up into the thousands of reviews yet. But you will see some pretty incredible feedback that we're getting from consumers because, again, our stuff works due to this bioavailability factor that we believe we've conquered compared to a lot of the competition. We're using... Uh, all natural products. We're not using anything like polysorbate 80, which uh, in our opinion is bad news. I mean, polysorbate 80 is an emulsifier that a lot of companies use. You're probably never going to see the results of a clinical trial on polysorbate 80 simply because no institutional review board is going to approve uh, a polysorbate 80 study, just like no IRB is ever going to approve a, a study using cigarettes or alcohol either. <laughs> just ethically, it's not going to happen. But what we do know from polysorbate 80 is in rodents, it, it tends to do not good things. 
Now, people who are using polysorbate 80 will make the argument, yeah, but we're only using a little bit. Okay, fine. Well, I mean, would you only take a little bit of arsenic? I don't, I don't know. I probably wouldn't. Would you only consume a little bit of mercury? I don't know. I probably wouldn't. So, you know, there's clearly a gray area. And I, I know I'm making an argument uh, in, uh, in favor of us. But, again, we're trying to go with the all-natural approach. And we have a technology that is completely natural. And we don't have to use chemicals like that that could put people at risk of, uh, you know, something down the road. So this concept of bioavailability with our nano encapsulation technology is very important. And we believe that, again, as an example, where some of these turmeric and curcumin products on the market, they're telling the, the, uh, the buyer to take like a couple of grams per day, for example, and they know that their bioavailability is very low. So they're telling people to take a massive dose or amount of this stuff to maybe hope you get a couple of hundred milligrams in the system to do something. We have the complete opposite approach because of our nano encapsulation technology. We don't need to give somebody a couple of grams of that. I mean, you could, I've, I've actually taken 60 mLs uh, of our curcumin in one day and I didn't have any adverse side effects. So we know this stuff is incredibly safe, but unless you have like very, very active cancer or something for most people, there's no need to take any kind of dose like that. But with just a couple of hundred milligrams of our nano encapsulated curcumin, <clears throat> we can easily achieve therapeutic and physiological benefit uh, that's not even remotely possible with these other products that have no formulation technology behind them. So for us, that's a, that's a huge competitive advantage. That's great. So guys, for everyone listening, the website is nourish.me. So uh, the nourish without the O N U R I S H dot me. Is that correct, John? Yes. Okay. And if anyone wanted to reach you directly for, uh, you know, outside of the customer type zone, wanted to reach you for in regards to research or uh, anything, uh, email or reach you through the websites. Sure, absolutely. Please uh, have anyone contact me at john at nourish.me, J-O-H-N at nourish.me, as you said, without the O, N-U-R-I-S-H dot M-E. And the product he was referring to was Cogni Nourish, C-O-G-N-I-N-U-R-I-S-H. Yes. So, John, uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very educational, lots, uh, lots of information there. Thank and, you. And uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to, uh, you know, being back again, if you like. I, again, I can talk about this stuff forever. <laughs> so it's, it's a passion of mine, as you can tell. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I've done something that will help people uh, understand about, you know, what polysaccharides and curcumin can do for health. So thank you again for having me on your show. Awesome. Thanks. Welcome to this channel. I am Dr. Steven De Vos, the lifting dermatologist, and this is my bro science hunting partner, Danny Bossa. If you want to learn more about the most cutting edge science based information in the world of hormone optimization, please like and subscribe. Click the bell button to get notified. I also invite you to join my other YouTube channel, The Lifting Dermatologist. The link you can find in the description of this video.